Lie. So hope everyone is well. Let's have a quick recap of kind of close from yesterday and some of the, the main highlights and then we'll review some of the, the headlines from this morning and then what we're looking out for in the session ahead. And yesterday then, another positive close on Wall Street. A little bit of underperformance as we're well aware in NASDAQ after uh, the heavyweight alphabet had slightly weaker earnings, uh, more to do with their kind of increased costs uh, and revenues, although coming in just above median expectations, slightly below the top end, which disappointed those who are very accustomed to Alphabet kind of knocking it out the park on a regular basis, quarter to quarter. To quarter. Um, so the Nasdaq closed down about 0.2. S&P was up, though, 0.3%. Uh, the Dow was up 0.5. Pretty decent day for the Dow, of course, uh, on the back of several earnings. Uh, so just bringing my Dow future chart into into shot and you can see here from yesterday's price activity really it was from around 11 o'clock onwards that the Dow started to see some a pretty decent move to the upside now uh, granted technically we broke that kind of almost double top that we had from Friday and um, what would have been uh, the day before yesterday and uh, so that probably would have helped accelerate some of the move to the upside but ultimately you had a series of larger cap names all reporting uh, McDonald's, Caterpillar, Biogen, DuPont, uh, just to name a few. And not only did they exceed expectations on a, an earnings per share and a revenue basis, but they also increased uh, many of those companies, their uh, forward-looking guidance, which is, which is always key when you're monitoring these earnings reports as they come out. And so the Dow already moved higher into the actual open. That kind of lifted some of the sentiment. You can see here the S&P and the uh, my middle right chart here followed suit uh, and in terms of the S&P if we make this a little bit longer dated of course that was up at all-time highs again so just breaching the the high print that we're seeing well if we're just going back to last week we just got above there again that high that was seen around the 24 kind of 75 level we failed to really sustain that, but we are still up at around close to record levels in these US equity markets. Certainly earnings season, despite a fairly okay first week with the banks reporting, um, the rest of the companies seem to have, have picked up the pace a little bit. Uh, and against the five-year average, we're actually much higher in terms of the percentage of companies that are exceeding Wall Street expectations. So. Earnings season overall has been going fairly well. Uh, if you've read some of the news articles this morning, uh, Thursdays tend to be typically the busiest days for corporate earnings season. And so that's tomorrow. And in Europe, tomorrow morning, there is approximately 3 trillion euros worth in terms of market weighted company value uh, that's going to be reporting tomorrow. And predominantly, they will come pre market open. So just giving you a heads up for tomorrow definitely if you're trading european equities you need to be absolutely up to speed ahead of uh, eight o'clock cash open what all those earnings reports are and we'll have a look at that in a second uh, but the other factor obviously it wasn't just an earnings play that helped lift some of the sentiment yesterday it was also economic data and german ifo which is typically seen as one of the kind of uh, top tiered economic data points out of Europe for one because it's Germany so representative of the, the kind of most powerful nation in Europe by size and economic output and companies forward-looking expectations how positive they are about the future is obviously very critical for their investment decisions coming up and then for growth of companies uh, and their performance going forward and actually IFO that came in at 116 which was above expectations of 114.9. In fact, the highest reading since 1991. So that too at yesterday also helped in some of that equity play. The yen and gold were overall weaker for the session. Uh, and what it did prompt actually in terms of euro dollar currency pair was an extension of the move that we had seen kind of following on from Draghi's optimism this was the little blip higher that we had kind of following on from the post data and we managed to, to breach those highs that were seen at the end of last week uh, following the ECB press conference. So again, 
punching well above the 117 handle. But once we got to R2, then we started to pair back down as the dollar has seen a bit of renewed strength as we kind of now uh, refocus our attention towards the FMC, which of course will come later on tonight. Um, so overall though, from a, a Euro perspective, much longer time frame. Uh, obviously these are pretty critical levels that we're trading at from a, a technical standpoint. Uh, we've looked at this before, but obviously We've managed to very briefly get above that high point seen uh, in the summer of 2015. And that puts us then back at levels in the euro, which we printed at the highs yesterday, not seen since really we're going all the way back to, we're talking end of 2014, beginning of 2015 type era. And so uh, right at the upper bound of this kind of range that we've been in for really the last two years. Uh, I guess now we kind of, hand over the baton slightly to the US. Uh, a lot of people obviously going to be awaiting the FOMC decision. A lot of attention towards this balance sheet tightening, which is basically a, uh, a way of uh, removal of accommodative monetary policy. And as such, then there could be a potential for dollar led movement in this currency pair. And so maybe we could be in for, uh, barring anything unexpected, a fairly quiet session here as people kind of sit on their hands waiting for 7 p.m. that announcement's gonna come. Um, we can see already this morning, we've had a little run lower when Europe's come into the market in the Euro dollar pair. Uh, got briefly below the, uh, well, we're looking at Monday's low here, uh, tested, uh, and then we found a bit of a floor at that point shortly after around eight o'clock before just steadying here more recently. Um, one of the other things, though, that has happened overnight, and you've probably realized this morning, is crude oil is seen higher on the front foot already, up 65 cents. And most notably is this pop in the prices here that we've had last night, shortly after half past nine in the evening. This is, of course, coming on the back of the latest API crude oil infantry data. So if we actually look firstly at oil over the course of the last three days, we've seen a pretty decent rise here. We've gone all the way from sub 46 from the beginning of the week, all the way up to really just heading towards $49. Uh, the catalyst here has been, from a fundamental perspective, a little bit of a escalation in Saudi's intervention to kind of prop up the price by saying that they're going to quite dramatically cut down on their number of exports. Uh, so that's kind of initiated the move, but obviously you've had this biggest bullish candlestick has come off the back of the APIs. So reviewing those numbers, what do they look like? The headline reading was a drawdown of 10.2 million. Now, I would say statistically, it's not very often that you see these numbers go into uh, drawdowns or builds of a double digit figure. Um, it has happened before. As a reference point, I, I guess the largest drawdowns tend to be, or the largest drawdown on record is circa 14 and a half million. So this isn't the uh, biggest drawdown I've ever seen. Uh, it's only the biggest drawdown since September 2016. So actually, if we just click on this chart here, this is actually the DOE numbers. This, so this is the API they map on the, the blue bar. So obviously a big drawdown. Uh, but these are the AP, these are the DOE headline readings. And so this was that 14 and a half one that I'm referring to here. So it doesn't happen very often. Obviously, look, going back all the way to really March of 2016, you can see very rarely does that happen. On the flip side, you can see here, this is when we were having some builds uh, in around kind of late 2016 of uh, above 10, kind of circa 12 million. Uh, so just to give you a reference point of the kind of swings that you tend to see, it's good to have a, an idea historically how much this data can move in terms of actual figures. The drawdown expectation was for just 3 million. So obviously, very bullish outcome here, uh, and hence the price kind of bolting higher overnight. Cushing, uh, again, this number obviously is nowhere near as sizable as the crude figure, but as far as Cushing... Uh, is concerned. This is one of the biggest numbers you'll like to see in in a number of months and again was kind of two and a half times the consensus estimate. Gasoline 
was a bit of a surprise though. And this is quite counterintuitive to the overall tone of what those previous two figures would suggest, which are ultimately very bullish. Gasoline was a build of 1.9. Expectations were for a draw of 1.8. So this is the opposite. This would be bearish for prices. So maybe an outright kind of aggressive bid going beyond what we've seen might be slightly tapered by the fact of this number. And then obviously the APIs, we don't see what US output is. They come with the DOEs. But US output, well, if we just go back to the charts, this is where US output currently resides at this present point in time, and 9.429 million. So it's at the highest, certainly year to date, when we were tracking actually sub at the beginning of the year. If we go back to here, the 6th of Jan, which was the first reading of the week, we were 8.946 million. So we've had a pretty decent run on the back of that, or since that point, and now we are targeting really the, the highs of 2015, kind of going into the summer period. We're pretty much on track to hit that in the coming months. Uh, so US output obviously has been on the increase, which again would be a more bearish factor. So looking at what to expect from the data when it comes out later, the one thing is, this often is the case when you're trading this DOE numbers, is the market tends to react in different phases, let's say. First of all, the market reacts to the headline figure, <coughs> ultimately. That's the first move. Now, the one thing I would stress here, and we'll talk about the DOEs more when we get closer to the release, but the drawdown last night was, again, 10.2 million. So the market has already factored in and repositioned itself by the fact it's moved higher for an equal size kind of drawdown coming from the DOEs. Therefore, if the DOEs print a drawdown of say 8 million or 9 million, which is still exceptionally large, actually that's bearish because the market expectation, the bar has been set quite high now. And what we tend to see when the APIs have a big outlying number is that the, the DOEs rarely live up to the kind of hype, so to speak, because ultimately what you need is a drawdown of 11 million, 12 million, which then starts to become a statistical anomaly if you're looking at the, uh, the history of the data. Uh, that's what you would need to bump this price up again, another kind of aggressive leg higher. The Cushing, obviously, in the API is pointed to the same direction, but the problem you also have is that the second phase of the move tends to be a market reaction and digestion of the US output figure, which typically takes an additional minute or two to come out. And then after the markets kind of reassess the entire report with that added information that US output, which actually a few weeks ago was up as much as 1%, which is a phenomenally huge amount, then you start to see a counterintuitive move to what is the bullish headline, if that makes sense. So. I guess if you're looking at it at like that basis, uh, the headline is going to be ultimately very important. Can the DOEs equate to as bullish report, i.e. be as deep a drawdown? I would say the chances of that are fairly unlikely. And so therefore, you might just get this kind of almost pre-positioning up. The data comes out. Yes, it's a drawdown, but not quite as deep as the, the APIs. And then you get US output up, and then we move lower again and take back some of that move. I would say that's probably the baseline scenario with how I would approach the, the crude oil numbers later. Uh, but again, I can't stress how important enough the, uh, the US output figure is. Uh, and about if you're going to trade these data points effectively in a short time frame, then ultimately that, that number can be key for the overall outcome and direction of, of the data thereafter. Uh, but certainly yesterday with the equity moves, solid German IFO, oil continuing to track higher with some of the, the bullish comments out of Saudi, uh, and now with some API data, uh, and then plus positive corporate earnings. You've got a trifecta of positive things going on here. And if you look at it this morning, then look at equities already on the front foot. Europe is also underway with earnings. Uh, a couple that I've seen this morning uh, in the car making sector, one of the outperformers, they were up about three and a half, four percent last time I checked. Uh, not a particularly big stock, but uh, can help act as a bit of a, a sentiment play, I guess. 
for uh, the the overall car making sector. Peugeot first half profit jumps as it upgrades its auto market forecast. So again, it's these forward looking um, outlooks that they have for both profit and and revenues that are being upgraded, which is a, a really positive sign for the European economy. And all the more reason, again, for this was reflected in IFO to some respect. Uh, and this is what's giving Draghi and his, M his ECB members you know, confidence to become more uh, hawkish by being more optimistic about prospects for European economy. Uh, other car maker Daimler was a little bit uh, bucked the trend, but they're actually still slight positive despite the fact that their earnings missed estimates as their truck division profit had fallen. Uh, but there have been a, a series of other earnings reports which have been, again, reflection of the U.S., uh, more good than bad is the kind of summary without going into every individual company. So the DAX already having a little look above uh, yesterday's highest point, and we just had a little brief run on R1 before just coming back to exactly that level. So potentially then, uh, maybe an entry point here for... Uh, if you're looking to, to get long on these, these bullish uh, kind of fundamentals that have been occurring. So we've just pulled back now to that, that previous day's high uh, in the DAX. Okay, looking at some other pieces of information that have come out overnight that you should be aware of. This is the Aussie dollar I'm now looking at. And the Aussie, as you can see, the Aussie's been weakening overnight. Actually, we saw this huge bout of volatility. You can see that here defined by the, the extension of those wicks on either side of that, that body on that time frame at 2.30. 2.30, of course, is Australian data releases, and this was their CPI data overnight. You can see this quite wild price activity over the actual release. But thereafter, we broke, you can see here, that level of support technically from uh, the, the session prior uh, and also to the beginning of the week during the, the overnight Asia Pac session. That support level was taken out and we've declined lower and we've remained lower on the session at the moment. And uh, so that level there at S1 looks quite interesting. Uh, if you were going to continue that, that trend, you've got S1 78.98. That kind of matches up then with that break of that level if you were uh, playing that trend for an entry to, to follow it lower again. Why did it move? Overnight, well, Australian CPI for Q2, 0.2%. Below the expected 0.4, year-on-year 1.9 against 2.2. So lower inflationary readings coming out of Australia. Coupled that then, if you remember, there was uh, the latest communication from uh, officially in their last meeting from the RBA was deemed to be quite hawkish. They were talking about a new neutral rate and so on. But since that point, they've been kind of talking it down, the prospects of imminent tightening. And RBA governor, speaking last night, said there is no need to move in lockstep with other central banks that are tightening, and that steady unemployment rate has allowed the RBA to be patient. So essentially, you deem this to be, okay, telling the market, don't get too running away with yourself that we're turning hawkish. Don't forget interest rates in Australia are much higher than they are in Western Europe, so they feel they don't really need to act too much at this point. Uh, and the fact that everyone else is acting in a quite a coordinated fashion at the moment doesn't mean that we're going to do the same. And so it's kind of a dual fundamentals here weighing on the, the Aussie overnight. Low inflation, coupled with some more dovish rhetoric out of the central bank, just pushing the price down. Uh, and I guess if you look at the likes of gold as well in the co commodity market, which can have a little bit of a, a read across into these commodity related currencies and gold's also down about seven dollars with some of this renewed risk on appetite that we've had okay i i was trying to find uh obviously again talking about donald trump of course i was trying to find an article from donald trump pre the election to give you a little bit of context for a subject i'm just going to talk about and this is a, this is talking about trump and his view about janet yellen and this article I've, I've caught from the Wall Street Journal. So this was September 26th of 2016. Now if you remember, of course, this predates then the US election, which of course happened in, in November. But this was the exact article that was released. Donald Trump attacks Federal Reserve Yellen during a debate. So this was the, you know, when they were doing the campaign trails, squaring off with um, Hillary Clinton on 
on various news channels debating or arguing, I should say. But Trump, then the nominee, redoubled his efforts to attack the Fed and specifically Janet Yellen, accusing the central bank of doing political things by keeping interest rates low. So this was September, pre-election. This is this morning. Same, same news agency. Conan Yellen, among Trump's contenders to lead Fed. Donald Trump said, specifically in this article, quote, I like Janet. I like rates being low. She's historically been a very low rate person, and I like that. So, <laughs> quite unbelievable this guy is. Uh, again, in this article, Trump reiterating, I think Yellen's doing a good job, and I have a lot of respect for her. Um, and so, another U-turn, unsurprising. Uh, we're becoming accustomed to this, but... The whole point here being in a, in a bigger, grander scheme of things is really two things. One, from a Federal Reserve point of view, we heard last week in that Politico article, sources were suggesting that uh, Cone was being talked about. This is a, uh, a commercially minded guy who works for Goldman Sachs. A lot of politicians not quite sure if that's really the right move to go down because Trump's pretty much entire team seems to be from Wall Street, specifically Goldman Sachs, and that makes a lot of uh, politicians quite nervous about the leadership of the country uh, but Janet Yellen could stay and obviously that could be quite instrumental then to uh, the much longer term prospects for monetary policy uh, obviously we're going through quite a very interesting phase which is really going to be initiated kind of now and into September in particular tightening of the balance sheet another interest rate hike in December you know, does she kind of step away at that point? I would say her staying, adding continuity would help, I guess, uh, keep market confidence in that respect. Because if someone else comes in, ultimately Trump's probably going to get one of his, his preferred candidates in. Uh, the market won't know that person as well. And that tends to destabilize the situation and create uncertainty, which causes market disruption in that respect. So something to look out for. The other thing here is about Trump, and it's about his ability to kind of get the job done. Um, and if we look at things like the repeal of Obamacare, so that took a little bit of a step forward yesterday. They secured 51 to 50 votes to allow senators to start debating on the health care legislation. Now, the way that U.S. Um, legislation works is that you have to have a vote to have the vote, if that makes sense. So you have to all have an agreement that you want to have a vote on a, on a rule. He hasn't even been able to get that done. But the one step forward was that they agreed that, yes, we should have a vote. And so now that's gone through. But then this morning, the Senate has now rejected the Senator McConnell's replacement plan by a vote of 43 to 57. What this means then is this, this latest version of the health care bill is basically going through series of revisions and I guess compromises in order to get the number of acquired votes on board and eventually I'd probably expect that this will pass. Now when the healthcare, the new one, does pass and the repeal of, repeal of Obamacare after months actually gets done, I don't think you're going to see this spectacular move in financial markets. Um, Trump, as a timeline, has said his next, um, next topic on the agenda would be the corporate tax issue. But as we've already heard last week, his phenomenal tax plan, which was to cut 35 to 15%, has now moved from 15% to somewhere in the 20s. And so I think the market is just getting a little bit fatigued with this flip-flopping of Donald Trump. And the most important thing is we've started to ignore basically what he's saying from a tweeting point of view, from a letdown point of view, and actually, I think the market is starting to look a little bit more at the fundamentals where granted inflation is not possibly where the Fed want it to be, but overall economic growth on a global level is, is being fairly healthy. Corporate earnings we're seeing is uh, quite strong. And also, um, you know, some of these uh, indicators like what we've had in Europe where sentiment, confidence on a, on a consumer and a corporate level is still relatively high. And so equity markets, 
uh, certainly up at record high levels, but the VIX index yesterday, I mean, I saw it, it almost went into the 8 region, which I don't think I've ever seen. Uh, but certainly volatility in that measure is particularly low, which is, I think, a reflection of the fact that, you know, Trump being impeached or anything like that, these probes, his involvement in Russia, I really don't think this is going to amount to anything personally. And I think the market is starting to move on a little bit and accept that Trump will communicate and govern the way that he is. Uh, and so, yeah, almost that kind of uh, desensitization to, to that situation. But obviously the corporate tax, if this healthcare issue passes, that would be a big thing. But I would anticipate that this is going to be many, many, many months before we actually see any kind of ground made on, on that regard. I would say monetary policy is probably going to be the more defining factor, given we're going through a very important phase of that process coming up in the coming months. Okay, having a look then at a few other things. Uh, just quickly on the, the topic of earnings season, this is something I do want you guys to be very um, prudent about doing. This is more specifically aimed at the interns. And this is the Bloomberg earnings calendar. Um, so a day like today, you could click on the US and you know I'd have just a skim through, see who's coming out, any big names that you can identify, just to be aware of that could be either creating an opportunity ahead of the market open in the futures market movement, or um, you're in a trade and there, you know there's a risk that you might see a bit of movement coming thereafter. So you can see the number of companies obviously has picked up substantially. The other thing though is if you click on the other country, so let's take Germany for example, if you go to tomorrow, we've already identified the fact that there's about equivalent 3 trillion euros worth company value reporting tomorrow. So someone like Germany, for example, if you're looking at the DAX, you know, who is reporting tomorrow? Well, actually, you've got one of the biggest companies within the index, BASF. You've also got Bayer, another one of the largest companies. You've also got Deutsche Bank. You know, this is when you prepare ahead of time. All of these companies here will report pre-market open. So this kind of preparation is, is absolutely key during uh, and pivotal during these quarterly earnings periods. Okay, quick look at the calendar for today. Uh, coming up in half an hour's time, you've got UK GDP. This is the preliminary uh, reading for the second quarter. I would say the, the second quarter is looking for a slight rebound here. Um, but nothing to the strength of what we saw in Q2 of last year. This then starting to fill the effect of a little bit of the, the general slowdown in the economy of post-Brexit uh, and most notably the impact that the, the price pressures are having on the consumer and so on and so forth. So we're expecting 0.3% today. This is the preliminary reading. Um, the better weather conditions over that specific period of the year may have helped out a little bit on the upside, uh, but I'd say risk is um, that markets will have worries about if we were to get a low number to further destabilize the, the sentiment that is, is getting increasingly negative at the moment on the prospects for UA, UK economic growth going forward, uh, certainly with Brexit underway, Brexit negotiations. Uh, so that's coming out at half past nine. Keep an eye out on that for sterling traders. Uh, cable not really doing a great deal at this this moment, just awaiting the numbers, so we're pretty flat in the pair. And then going into the afternoon, uh, you've got new home sales and then the crude oil inventory data, which of course, as we discussed, we'll use the APIs as our kind of benchmark. And then ECB's Sabine Lautenschlager, who's part of the kind of executive council, so she doesn't represent the Bundesbank, that's Jens Weidmann, so she's more aligned with Draghi, Constancio and so on on the executive board. So she tends to be uh, fairly aligned with them in terms of overall centered policy view. But I would definitely be keeping an eye out, even though she's just at a book presentation, if she feels warranted, given the fact that we've traded up at these multi-month highs in the euro just yesterday, does she feel that she needs to, to talk about policy in order to control that euro currency not getting too strong? And then, of course, the, the main event, 7 p.m., we'll have the Fed. Uh, remember, final word of warning here, this is, uh, well, let's have a look at a description. I've sent out this, this report to you. This is the Danske Bank FMC preview. I'll talk about the FMC a lot more detail later and how we'll interpret this and how we'll kind of 
match statement to statement to see subtle word changes and so on and the structure of those statements. But overall, and I think this is pretty much in line with the consensus of, of things to look out for, uh, Danska is saying we, don't do, we do not think that there will be major changes in the FOMC statement, although it's likely the probability is skewed towards a slightly more dovish tone given the inflation has now been weaker than expected for four consecutive months. So do they pay note of that trend would be deemed to be dovish in that scenario. Deutsche Bank say the Fed will likely announce a taper of the balance sheet reinvestment in September and will hike rates again in December. So again, September and December are crucial months because unlike today's announcement, which is just a statement and the interest rate announcement, in September we get, and in December, the summary of economic projections, which is their forecast for growth, inflation, employment. And we also get Janet Yellen, who can use the press conference and Q&A session to help kind of alleviate any uh, misunderstanding of any policy change that they do. She can then have the press conference to kind of steady the ship, so to speak, thereafter. That tends to be the usual central bank uh, kind of communication tactic. Okay, going to leave it at that. It's your morning briefing. So have a good day ahead. Any questions, of course, just put them in the chat room. Uh, I'll be here all morning. Uh, I've got a few lectures to deliver in the afternoon, but then I'll be back to cover the Fed this evening. Okay, guys, have a good day. Thank you.